Hi, this is Joaquin van Schoren again, and today we'll talk about automated machine learning and learning to learn. So what is automated machine learning? Normally, when we solve machine learning tasks, we need a human expert that looks at the task and then manually tries to build some models, then looks at the performance of those models, and then based on his or her own intuition, and all these trials tries to build better and better models, right? So you try something, you see how well that works. If it works, you try something similar. If it doesn't work, you try something different, right? So you, you keep doing this over and over again until you find a model that's good enough. In automated machine learning, we want to replace this tedious trial and error by data-driven intelligent algorithms that will search for the best model in a purposeful way. So we will replace the human partly with learning optimization algorithms that will build many algorithms by themselves, look at the performance and learn from that how to build the next model in a better way. So ultimately the goal would be, at least for their scientists, to take away part of their work or to take over part of their work so that they can focus on more important stuff uh, all related to uh, building machine learning models and deploying them in real life. Now, in practice, um, we cannot completely automate this, at least not now. Um, so th there will always be an element of the human in the loop. So we'll still focus on developing the best learning and optimization techniques to build these models in an inner loop, uh, and then have these systems create the models and explanations that then a human expert can look at uh, and then decide whether that's good enough or whether it needs to restart the optimization in a different way, maybe change an objective function, maybe change the data, try something else. And maybe even in the future, we'll have automatic systems that actually ask the human what to do with certain things. For instance, if it finds outliers or missing values, it may want the opinion of a human domain expert to know what to do with that. So I think at least for the foreseeable future, we'll have these kind of systems where the human is in the loop. And of course, domain knowledge cannot easily be encoded in these systems. So having these human, expert, having these human experts and the domain knowledge remains crucial. Okay, so one thing, one problem we can solve with automated machine learning is pipeline synthesis. Right? So we've seen different ways to build machine learning models. And typically, uh, we take some training data. We then pre-process the data in a certain way. We then select the features. Then we choose an algorithm. And then we look at how well that works. Right? Um, that's a simple pipeline, pipeline that we can do. We call this a pipeline. Um, now we want to optimize this, right? because all these steps have different options. We have different feature extraction techniques. We have different ways of pre-processing. We have different algorithms, and all these algorithms have their own hyperparameters that we want to tune. So we need to optimize this pipeline. Also, we need to optimize these hyperparameters. So both the, the structure of the pipeline and the hyperparameters have to be tuned. And even when all that is done, and we want to deploy this model in real life, in real life, the data changes. and the model that was working well yesterday may not work well today anymore. So we need to continuously monitor and adapt uh, the pipelines so they can continue to work well. Especially like adapting existing solutions is a major open problem, how to do this in an automated way. So right now, the current situation is we have all these excellent tools like scikit-learn, um, but there's no, relatively little guidance on which algorithms to use in which situations, right? Same problem for deep learning, right? So in this case, we call this a neural architecture search. Um, so similar problem. So we have all different kinds of operators. We have, for instance, convolutional nets. We have different size of layers, different filter sizes. Uh, maybe we would have skip connections between layers. Um, and then we have different high, different high parameter settings, just such as uh, gradient descent, learning rate, momentum, 
progression, L1, 2, L2 loss, drop out rate, and so on. All these things we want to tune. And ideally, we want to have, again, an automated system that starts from simple models, uh, builds more complex ones, and then learns from that and builds increasingly better models in an automated way. When we talk about hyperparameters, we of course mean every design decision that has to be made by the user. And these come in very different forms, which are sometimes hard to deal with. Uh, most of them are numeric, like the learning rate. Uh, of course, we know this is very important to tune. If the learning rate is too small, we need many, many iterations before we find a good solution. If the learning rate is optimal, we'll find a good solution in just a few epochs. If the learning rate is too large, we can actually diverge and get increasingly worse performance. So next to these numerical um, hyperparameters, we also have categorical ones. For instance, the, the type of layers. We may want to have convolutional layers, pooling layers, dense layers, regularization layers, and so on. So there's different way, different kind of layers we want to tune, and this choice is a categorical one. And some are even conditional. So, for instance, if we choose a convolutional layer, then you also have to choose the filter sizes and the stride lengths, which has, of course, a huge effect on what the model will learn. So we have to, ha we have to be able to deal with all these different types of hyperparameters. And we can often see that tuning this is not so easy uh, because Typically, models are very sensitive to a lot of hyperparameters. If, if we change them only a little bit, performance can go massively up and down. So here we have a simulation for a uh, neural net with six um, hyperparameters, like the learning rate and dropout. And we see here the test accuracy in green, training accuracy in orange. And we see as we change these six hyperparameters, um, performance can go up or, or completely drop down to zero right? or to some baseline. Um, and people often use random search for this. So they randomly try some high parameters until they accidentally find a good solution. But of course, we want to find a better way. So the question here is, can we do better than random search? Can we, can we solve this problem in, a gel, in an intelligent way? Can we get enough signal from first set of experiments so that we can deduce what works well and what doesn't work well so that we can construct ever better models. Now we can we can subdivide this problem into three subproblems. First of all is the architecture search. That means how can we represent the architectures typically as a graph with different layers or so this can be operators in a pipeline. So you have a pipeline that splits up in two and then joins at the end again. Or it can be a neural uh, architecture where these are layers. Then we have a branch and then, for instance, a concat at the end and so on, right? Um, and we also need a way to search this, this, this possible uh, space of pipelines, right? So if the architecture can be any graph, then we need a way to search this space of all possible graphs. Current ways to to create these pipelines are typically like a scikit-learn type pipelines, which are quite linear. Although we can also have nonlinear pipelines, of course. Um, we can create those pipelines with code like this. Like we create a pipeline with an encoder, imputer, scalar, and then a support vector machine. If we use Keras, we can build models by adding layers, layer by layer, and so on. Right? We can also do branches and so on, of course. Um, the next question, once we have this architecture, is how can we tune the hyperparameters? Because different layers or different operators will have their own hyperparameters, and we need to find an, intel an intelligent way to tune them. Um, in scikit-learn, for instance, we can do a random search. We can say, well, we have this parameter C in here, in this support vector machine, and the parameter gamma, uh, we can say, how these should be scaled. And then we can use like a random search to explore this space for us and tell us which one is the best in 200 iterations. 
we can do this now, but of course we want to do this in a more intelligent way. Similar for Keras, we can actually define models um, and do a search over them. For instance, here we create a function that builds a model. Uh, this model adds a dense layer, and but this dense layer is not fully defined. It has a hyperparameter here for a number of units, and this hyperparameter says it's an integer between uh, 32 and 512 uh, units. And also, when we compile, we can say that the optimizer is not fixed, but we use Atom with a learning rate that can change uh, in this range. And then when we have defined this search space, we can again do random search um, over this space and, and, and look for the best one. Of course, it's very easy, but later on we'll see more intelligent ways, such as Hyperbent, for doing this. And finally, meta learning. Right. So say that we have solved this problem many times. We have created architectures, we've tried the high parameter settings, we evaluated them. We put a lot of work into learning what works and what doesn't work, right? We don't want to start from scratch every time you see a new problem, right? So you want to find a way that we can transfer experience from previous tasks so we can do new tasks much faster. And typically, this is something we have to do in real life because this whole space of possible architectures and so on is so large it doesn't make sense to start from scratch. And so if you really want to make this uh, robust and useful, we must find ways to transfer information from previous tasks. So the goal will ultimately be that, um, say that we train um, an automatic learner on a certain data set, x, y. This should give us a good model, of course. But then next time when we then want to uh, train this learner on a new data set, it should not start from scratch, but it should actually have transferred information from this data set one so we can solve uh, this at two faster. There's different ways of doing this. So, um, one common way is transfer learning in which we basically just take existing layers or a bunch of existing layers from a previous uh, neural net or if it's a pipeline, we take a set of operators from previous pipeline and we just transfer them without changing them. We keep the weights, we keep the parameters as they are. On the other hand, we can also do warm starting in where we either uh, warm start the high parameters. So we start searching for a good set of high parameters by taking ones that worked before. Or we can actually, sometimes we can actually also warm start the model parameters where we don't start training the model with uh, randomized small weights, but we actually start training the model initialized with some model parameters, which with some weights that we have transferred from previous problems. And we'll see how we do that. Okay, now in practice, you can have all kinds of combinations of these. A very common combination is that uh, we use meta learning to design a search space. A search space of possible architectures and high parameters that we should tune. And once we've done that, uh, we then have to choose a search strategy to search the remaining architectures. Then we try on architectures, we evaluate them, maybe we tune this in the loop and we get a score back and we loop over this. This is a very common scenario, uh, but it's not the only way we can do this. There's many other ways you can combine these three things together. And yes, this is a meta meta learning problem because uh, how you combine these, how you combine architectures and high parameter optimization, how you predefine these high parameters, that's again an optimization problem. So uh, indeed, this is um, a meta meta learning problem. Okay. Um, so first, for searching the architectures, there's different ways we can do this. I will cover the basic ones, which are either fixed architectures. We use reinforcement learning, we can use evolution, or we can use heuristic search. And there's some more, but we can't cover everything. OK, so first ID uh, is to parameterize the architecture. The idea here is basically that as you get more experience in how you build pipelines, 
you start seeing that there are certain pipelines which are usually successful. Certain combinations of preprocessing techniques or combinations of preprocessing and classifiers. For instance, if you use SVMs or neural nets, we always want to uh, scale the data, for instance. Right? Uh, we can learn this from experience. So we can also use this to define kind of a template pipeline that does certain operations in a certain order, like rescaling, model encoding for the categorical features, uh, imputation of missing values, balancing of imbalanced data. And after that, we select the features. And after that, we choose a classifier. This is a very typical pipeline. Uh, so once we have fixed this architecture, then we can expose the remaining options, for instance, which type of scaling or which type of imputation as high parameters. Right? And if we do that, then we basically have one architecture and we have basically added new high parameters uh, that decide whether or not we scale, if we do scale, which scaling we do. Right? So we add conditional or categorical high parameters to the problem. Uh, and this will create, this will turn architecture search into a higher parameter optimization problem. So it just, we can solve this by optimization alone. The nice thing here is that we create a smaller search case, right? Because we bring a lot of information like prior experience into the problem. Um, the downside is that you can't learn entirely new architectures. If you need to think outside the box, this, this approach can't do that. And it's different uh, algorithms um, that you can download and, and use that do this. Right? So every time I have a, a link here, uh, you can click on that and you will find the paper or a web page with more information about the algorithm. So you can do the same thing for neural architectures. A um, very simple approach is to uh, just parameterize sequential nets. Uh, that's very simple. So this this case, your neural net is just a sequence of layers. You only have to decide the number of layers, and then everything else is an option, like um, like the type of layers. Whether you want to have a dense layer here, or a convolution layer, or a max pooling, that's a high parameter, and then you need to tune that so you find the best kind, uh, the best um, neural architecture. Having this simple structure, of course, is easier to learn, but sometimes it's too simple. You can't find the best models in this way. On the other hand, you can also have a very complex parameterized graph, and you also add options for branching and joining and skip connections between layers and, um, and so on, right? We also call this a hypernetwork. So a hypernetwork is like the graph of all possible networks that you can build. So the good thing here is much more flexible, of course. Downside, it's much harder to search just because the number, the number of possibilities just increases exponentially. Okay, a variation of this um, are portfolios. So the idea here is that um, even within this smaller space of options, we know that some models often work well. So we can, instead of even designing a search space of possible pipelines, we can just predefine a number of pipelines. And then we call that a portfolio, like a predefined set of pipelines or architectures. And then whenever we see a new problem, we just try all of them and maybe we tune all of them a bit and then we're done. Right? Uh, yeah, so this is a very, uh, it's what, this is very good when you have not enough time, right? If you have to give a solution fast, it makes sense to just try maybe the, the 20 best models you know from experience and just see what works on your new data set and tune them a bit towards your new data set. And you're done. Uh, this is um, the approach in, in different uh, systems that you can also download and use. Uh, one of them is a Microsoft AutoML system, PFF. This actually has a database of several thousands of pipelines um, and it has a meta model that then uh, recommends which one of these are most most likely to work. And then you can also do this in the loop. You can try uh, several of these and see what works best on, you, on your new problem. Um, a much more constrained one is Amazon Autoglue one. It's very new. Um, so in this case, 
they have a portfolio that consists of two boosting algorithms. I think it's um, LightGBM and CatBoost. It uses Renaforest, it uses KNN, and it also uses a tabular neural net. Tabular neural nets are quite new. They are basically neural nets that you can run on tabular data, uh, normal featureized data, which is not raw data, where, where the features actually have meaning, right? Um, it really looks a bit like this, um, where you have categorical features, which will have to be embedded. You have numerical features, which you pass through a dense layer. Afterwards, you concat them together. Um, and then this is just one way of doing this that seems to work well. Uh, you split it up one into just a dense layer, and this one goes, this branch goes into uh, three uh, dense blocks, which have dropout and batch normalization. At the end, we add them together, so we can also learn interactions between the features, and this will give us the output. Right? And so uh, all these blue boxes you have to train. Right? So yeah, the idea here is that you start with some models which you think will always work. Well, you assume that the good solution will be in this space, and you, you then tune these techniques uh, until you find the best solution, and that's your final answer. Okay, now um, you can go much further in your in your architecture search, um, and again we can use experience here. Uh, people have been building large teams of people have been building um, very complex neural networks for tasks such as image classification and ImageNet, and this is one of these. It's called the Inception Network. And Inception Network has um, what we call motifs or cells, which means that there's a macro architecture. So first there's input and stemming, but then it has this block of convolution layers four times after each other. And then it has a reduction block, which reduces the, the resolution of the image. And then we have seven times this block, and then again reduction, and then three times this block. Right? So all of these blocks that do particular things like this one, um, that's pooling and then one by one convolution. So one by one convolutions are maybe a bit counterintuitive, uh, but they speed up computation a lot. So this one branches into pooling one conf, um, uh, just one conf, and then this is one conf and the typical tree by tree, and here we have again tree by tree, tree by tree, right? And then brings them together. The middle layers, they're a bit more complex. There's the, this, this branch is the same, this branch is the same, this branch is the same, except that we add deeper, uh, well, larger filters. This is a one by seven. And we have also these things where we go seven times one and one times seven and so on. And then the, the last layers here um, are again similar a bit, except that here we branch off again and here we branch off again as well. Right. But the basic idea is that it apparently makes sense to have macro architecture and then have these cells repeating multiple times. So we can use this information uh, when we want to design other uh, new architectures that look like this. Right? And this is called a uh, cell search space. So again we have a macro architecture and then we only have to learn these cells and then we can put these cells into a macro architecture. The idea here, well this has some benefits. Uh, one benefit, of course, is it's simpler to learn this. And there's also a very strong element of compositionality here uh, because we can learn these hierarchical building blocks. They're like Lego blocks, right, that you learn. And you can sometimes reuse them across tasks. And this is very useful because you can actually take like a smaller task, learn these cells, and then when you have a larger task, you can reuse these cells, right? Assuming that they learn something useful about the task, um, you can just transfer them to other similar tasks and hopefully they will still work. Um, yeah, um, so that, yeah, so you can, um, it, and the main benefit of course is that it makes the search space a lot smaller. You're now not searching in a space of all possible large graphs, but you're searching in a smaller graph space to learn the cells and you then combine them. Downside, 
you actually add a pretty strong domain prior, it may not generalize well to other tasks. A variation of this idea again is hypernetworks. So a hypernetwork, as I said before, is a network of all possible graphs that you can build. And one way of representing this is this kind of neural fabric. So this is a neural fabric for convolutional neural, um, nets. Uh, they have seven layers, uh, and every layer has certain scale. That, that means the size of the feature maps that come out of, of um, the size of the tensors, basically, right? That come um, that are produced by the layers. And you can design these uh, CNNs in different ways. So either you um, keep very large layers. Uh, so you go here, here, here. So the first two layers have the same scale. And then you scale down. So you add a max pool or a filter with try, whatever. The uh, resolution drops down. And so then you stay at this size for a while, and then you go down again. So this, this red um, neural net corresponds to this trajectory through the neural fabric. Okay. Well, this one uh, starts the same size, but then uh, gets smaller and smaller, and then stays the same size. You get this. Okay. Now, this uh, makes the search space a bit smaller, of course, which is nice. And uh, you can also share filter weights, uh, because if you have two networks, say this green one, doesn't go down but stays here and ends up in the same point here. It means it has at a certain location uh, the same size of tensor, right? So, and that means you can transfer the filter weights from the previously trained red one to the green one. So you don't have to start uh, this layer then using randomly initialized weights, but you can actually start them with weights that you've learned before, which will speed up the training, or speed up the, um, yeah, how fast you converge to a good solution. There's uh, different variations to this ID. Uh, one of them is efficientness. And basically, the basic idea here is that you train a reinforcement learning agent to learn how to draw a path through here, right? to learn how to create a network from the hypernetwork graph. Uh, you can also try one-shot models. So these are, so one-shot model is basically the combination of all possible models that you can build, and you train them all in parallel. And to avoid overfitting, you can do something called path dropout, right? So um, at a certain point, when you have a batch of data you train, uh, you don't train every layer all the time, but you train only some layers uh, some of the time. Right. And then you have another uh, method called smash. Um, so here you you train all these networks that go through here, but you have a meta model on top that uh, basically looks at which are good model weights in this hyper network. And it will then recommend, if you have a new model, it will recommend what are good model weights given the architecture. These are quite advanced, right? So, and, and, and they're not researched so much anymore, but it's interesting that you can do this. Okay, so that's all for the architectures. Now the next question is how can we do this efficiently, right? Because it's easy to create a very large search space and then search forever. Uh, we actually want techniques that will uh, return to us a good solution in reasonable time. And there's different approaches to do that. Uh, one of the best to know is just random search. We'll also talk about heuristic search and Bayesian optimization and other kinds of techniques. So most common way of solving this uh, parameter tuning problem is random search. And it's surprisingly effective. The main reason for this is that random search is very good at ignoring unimportant parameters, while a grid search or, um, say, Bayesian optimization search tries to pay equal attention to every hyperparameter 
random search just randomly picks points, which means that if you have an unimportant parameter, it will still explore all the other uh, parameters at, with an equal amount of resolution, basically. While in this grid search, uh, it, you want to explore this parameter as well. So you spend time exploring this thing and it doesn't give you any signal. It doesn't improve the model. And you only have explored three points in this other parameter. While the random search means you have explored 10 points or nine points. Uh, so you have better coverage of this high parameter, even if this one is unimportant. So just intuition about why random search uh, seems to work well. And especially when you have many high parameters and many of them are unimportant, it's actually not a bad approach. Um, one of the uh, quite recent results actually um, is that you can do random search for neural octopus search as well. So this is the same idea as here. So we want to create these cells, but instead of learning these cells, we just create them randomly. Right. And so you get these kind of cells. This is a normal cell. This is a reduction cell. Uh, the normal cell does like convolutions and max pooling. So it does separate convolutions. That's just a faster way of doing it. It's a special type of convolution, uh, which you can break down into smaller convolutions, but still get the same result. Uh, so it's, it's a, yeah, it it's, uh, limits the kind of filters you can learn, but it's faster which is nice if you have to explore large spaces. And the reduction cell, which has lots of max pooling uh, to reduce uh, the, 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 redu the resolution of the image. So yeah, by just randomly designing these cells, um, well, sorry, by randomly searching uh, the structure of these cells, you can actually get a very good results. Uh, another, uh, um, Tool that you can download. Uh, it's called the uh, H2O HTML tool. You can just download it. Uh, it's open source. Well, it, there's an open source version at least. Um, it also does random search over pipelines. So it has these parameterized pipelines that we saw before, like these ones. And it does a random search over these. And when it has explored like 20 or maybe 100 of these pipelines, it builds a stacking model on top of them. And so it can either have like, um, so it takes the results of all these 20 pipelines and then at the end creates another stacked algorithm, like it can be a linear model, it can be gradient boosting, whatever. That then takes the results of these pipelines and then learns the final results from them. Yeah, so this actually seems to work very well as well. Uh, one step up from random search, uh, you can do a USIC search. And the most common technique to use here is Monte Carlo tree search. So the idea here is that you keep a tree of all the possible pipelines or graphs that you have explored so far. So say, thinking about pipelines, for instance, um, this, these are operators then, and every pipeline is then a path through this tree. Right? So operator one, operator two, operator three, operator four, that's one pipeline. And this is not a pipeline we explored before, right? So every pipeline we explored is in this tree. And we also give each operator a weight of how useful this operator is. Okay, then we select an interesting pipeline from this tree, an interesting path. And then we expand it. We add a new node to the tree. And how you do that, there's different ways of doing this. And once you, once you do that, you want to know, okay, is this expansion any good? Uh, but you cannot always test this pipeline right away because it may not be complete. Similar for an architecture, uh, if you add a layer, you, it may not be a complete neural net, which you, uh, you may not be able to train it. So you use a playout strategy. You complete the pipeline and you complete the neural net so that you can test it. And then when it's tested, the distributely randomly play out, played out. Just add random layers until you get something that works. Um, and then after you evaluate it, you backpropagate the results back to the tree, which means you 
if the model is very good, you increase the goodness of all these nodes. If it's a bad model, you decrease the goodness, right? And so you kind of learn which pipelines work well, and you can search heuristically through this entire space of pipelines. One variation of this is the same ID, but in this case, instead of using a heuristic to choose how to expand this network, or, or it can be a rule, um, you use a reinforcement learning agent. Right? So you train reinforcement learning agent, which is represented as a neural net, which learns a policy network. And this reinforcement learning agent has to decide, sorry, what to do next. Right? So it can do things like adding a component, leading components, replacing them, and so on, right? And this agent is trained by looking at lots of pipelines and their evaluations. And based on that, it then decides, it, well, it gets a new pipeline, and that has to say what, how to choose a new action. Uh, and it does this for a number of times until the pipeline is complete and it's evaluated, and then it gets a uh, reward uh, based on whether the decisions were good or not. And then you can, this referral agent can go to many, many iterations of self-play. It can just try different policies, um, and every time we finish a pipeline, uh, we get a result, a reward back, and we can use this reward to then train the agent. Right? And yeah, in that way, it can learn how to build the pipelines. Uh, another quite, this is actually an older ID, um, but has regained interest uh, recently, is to use planning, especially hierarchical planning. So the idea here is basically you, you use planning to create a plan for a path or for um, a neural network. Typically, this is hierarchical, so you can give a high-level task, such as classification, and then you have two options. So either you do preprocessing and classification, or you classify with a neural net. Say you choose to preprocess, you can either have a pipeline with one preprocessor, or you can have a pipeline with three preprocessors. And then as you go, as you complete uh, your um, your pipeline, you, you fill, you replace these with concrete implementations uh, until you have like a working pipeline, and then you can evaluate that. Right? And then again, you use um, as heuristic, you again use uh, path completion and you use a score as the pipeline as guided as heuristic uh, to how to complete the the plan. Okay, now, um, a very useful and very natural way of doing things is called base optimization. This is somehow similar to what you as a human would do when you try to optimize your high parameter. So say, for instance, that on the x-axis here, we have a high parameter, such as like the C parameter of gamma, or a C parameter of superfactor machine, or a learning rate in a neural net, right? And this performance. And okay, so say this is say this is the C parameter. Uh, we try one version of the C parameter, and we see the performance is this high, which is quite good. Uh, we can also try another C parameter, and we get this performance. So right now we just see those two black dots. Now we can reason um, where the best good solution would be. Right? So it's possible that if, since this is lower and this is higher, maybe even more to the right, even higher C, will give us the better results. Or maybe there's like a bump in between. We want to be between the two points here. So we don't know that, but we can um, basically guess where um, what the performance in between those points is right and we can actually model this using what we call a circuit model it's basically just a regression model a, a ballistic regression model that we fit 
to these two points here. So in the dashed line, that's my objective. That's the one I don't see. That's the true performance of my of changing this high parameter. Um, our surrogate model trained on these two points will learn this black line. And since it's probabilistic, it will also give us an uncertainty, which is shown here by the blue bands. Right, so this is this line here is the mean plus the variance uh, standard deviation, and this is the mean minus the standard deviation. Right. And then if we have this, we can decide if we know, if we have trained this surrogate model, we can decide what to do next. Now, if you would just take the optimum you would very easily um, get stuck in local minima. So we want to explore exploit. We want to find a configuration which has a high uh, predicted mean, but also has some uncertainty. Right? We want to exploit the good points, but we also want to explore the spaces where we have high uncertainty. And we can translate that into what we call an acquisition function, which is shown here by the green function. And so this green function will basically trade off this exploration and exploitation and recommend us a point here where we have a good trade off between high predicted performance, the mean, and high uncertainty. Right? And so once, so we can, we don't actually know this function completely, we don't know it analytic, analytically. But we can sample at different points. We can also use Thompson sampling to maybe sample around the points which look more interesting. And after that, we choose uh, the sampled uh, value of this high parameter that gives us the highest acquisition value. Right? And that's the one we then will try next. Right. So after we've done this exercise, we now decide that we want to evaluate uh, this value for the C parameter. And once we do that, uh, we will get a performance, which seems to be in between those two, and then we repeat. We then update this model, or we retrain a model with these three points, uh, and then we again get our surrogate. We again compute our acquisition function. In this case, it tells us the most interesting point is somewhere here. Yes, this is high predicted value and has high uncertainty. This is my next point, and then I will evaluate that and then I refit my model, and then I will, again, get a recommended new point to try. And you keep doing this either until you have like a fixed budget, like maybe 50 evaluations, or when you converge. Convergence means you either don't move anymore, or your acquisition function is below a certain threshold. There are actually some uh, theoretical guarantees that tell you that under certain conditions, um, this method will always give you a near optimal solution. The nice thing is it also works for very non-convex and noisy data, as we often encounter when we deal with hyperparameters. This is a top-level view in 2D. This was 1D, this is 2D. Uh, so here in the grid search, we just search over grid, right? So we choose a number of values, five, and we just try every combination of these. Random search just randomly chooses some points. Bayesian uh, optimization starts with a number of random points in the beginning. Those are the zero points. Dun, 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 dun. Right. From those initial points, we then fit a surrogate model over this, which you don't see here. So what, what we see here is the, the red is the, this is the response surface. So the redder, the better, the blue, the worse. So you want to find this point here. Uh, so random search gets sort of close to it, finds a reasonable solution, but doesn't find the optimal solution here. Um, so in Bayesian learning, up till now, we've only seen the zero points, which also don't find this optimal solution. But then based on these zero points, we then decide maybe I should look here because I haven't looked there yet. That's not so good. Maybe I should look here. That's a bit better. Maybe I should look here in the middle. Oh, this tree is pretty good. So I, I should search more around this. So I go four, five, six, seven. After that, um, that's now a trade-off. I have not improved so much anymore. And there's a whole other a part of the graph we haven't tried yet. So we, let's try that first. So eight, not so good. Nine's better. 
10, very bad, 11, oh, that's good. So we search more right here, and ultimately we find this point 16 here. And then, yeah, 17 is worse again, but it's, it has found a good solution in the process. Uh, an important question is, of course, okay, which surrogate model should you use? Uh, traditionally, the most commonly used ones are Gaussian processes. Um, and there's a tool called Etsky Optimize, which you can download and which will do this. Nice thing about Gaussian processes is they learn these very nice smooth uh, functions and they give you also great uncertainty estimates, right? So you have a very good uh, information about your high parameter space. Problem is it scales cubically uh, because you have to uh, construct your covariance matrix, right? Um, and invert that. So that's cubic, both in the number of high parameters and in the number of points you evaluate. The number of points is typically not such a big problem because you only maybe try like 10 or 20 or 50 of them. Uh, but if you have a space with 200 high parameters, then this will grind to a halt. It will take a very long time uh, before you optimize, up until you have trained the Gaussian processes, uh, surrogate models. So this tends to be quite slow then. So this is ideal uh, whenever you have relatively small high parameter spaces. Right? Whenever, when you're dealing with three or four numerical high parameters, this is totally fine. It will work very nicely. Um, if you actually have a very large high parameter space, one thing you can do is to is to uh, learn random embedding, like random projections, to reduce the dimensionality of your high parameter space and then do the Bayesian optimization in this lower dimensional uh, embedding. Another approach that's quite popular now is to use random forests. So the idea here is that instead of using a Gaussian process, which is expensive, you use random forest, which is much cheaper. Uh, not only does it scale well, I mean, random forest can use basically any number of high parameters, any number of features effortlessly, uh, it scales well. The downside is it, well, it's not a holistic method, right? So you kind of, approximate this uncertainty by looking at your individual trees. So say you build 100 trees and you're in a forest, you look at the predictions of those 100 trees and use the variance in their predictions as a measure of uncertainty. This is an approximation and it doesn't always give you a very good estimate of certainty. A second problem is that it doesn't extrapolate. Right? So if you have this green uh, objective function here, um, your linear, your, um, your random forest will, well, it'll actually learn like a step function, but you can interpolate between them to learn like this uh, piecewise model. Um, but if you are outside of your explored points, it just always waits the same value. It doesn't extrapolate well, while the Gush process do extrapolate very nicely. But it's, it's very scalable, it handles it handles conditionals very well, right? Because these, these are trees. If this, then, then, right? This is what they do. So if you have a parameter, if you choose, I don't know, uh, feature selection, uh, then try this uh, method. It handles this very well, very nicely. And this is this this is one of the most popular techniques. This is used in a method called SMAC, uh, a sequential model-based algorithm configuration. Uh, and a tool you can download, Autoskillearn. Autoskillearn uh, is, like I said, you can just download it, you can just import Autoskillearn, and you can then use this as any other scikit-learn estimator, except that it will not just fit a bottle, it will build a pipeline, right? So, so here you create it as usual, and then you fit it, and after you fit it, it will actually return to you a pipeline with multiple steps, an optimized pipeline. To it. In this fit, it will explore all possible pipelines. In, sorry, in this space, it will explore all these possible pipelines. Um, and you, 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 you tell it, um, for instance, to run for an hour, and after an hour, it comes back with 
not only the best pipeline it found, but it will, it will actually build an ensemble out of the best pipelines and then return it to you. Right. So it's a very convenient method uh, to automatically search for the best pipelines. Uh, this is a visualization of what happens internally. And um, so here we have the observed points. We have a space with two high parameters. And we see the best regions are on the top here or on the bottom left here as well. Uh, here we have performance. So this is the best performance. Uh, here we have the mean of the circuit model, right? So this is the circuit model that I'm training here, right? So in two dimensions, it looks like this. And because this is random forest, you will get these blocky um, regions. We can see this, it has, the model thinks that the interesting points are over here, right? So you can see over time, as it explores the space, it thinks, well, the most interesting regions are here. This region is not so interesting. Maybe this is a little bit interesting. This is the variance. It's also quite blocky. Um, so you can see there's still lots of variance, unexplored regions here and here. And this is the expected improvement. So this is where it tells you to look next. Right? You can see it very quickly focuses on this region. It's also known to maybe overexploit a bit. Uh, so it kind of keeps hanging around in this region. And this is time. So yeah, you will also see that this method actually has two time curves. That's because it does one iteration of random, uh, of um, Bayesian optimization, and then does random search, and then Bayesian optimization, and random search. So it interleaves random search and uh, Bayesian optimization, basically to avoid overfitting. You can see, yeah, these are the, the fast random search models and the slower random forest models. So random forest models are tend to be slow um, as you go on. Uh, yeah, another thing you can do, so instead of building these cubically scaling uh, Gaussian processes, you can also um, try to first learn a base expansion for your hyperparameter space. Right? So the only reason why you need these very complex curvy lines here is because your hyperparameters can behave in different ways. Um, for instance, the CO GAM parameter will typically behave more exponentially, or uh, while others, well, that means that you would actually vary them exponentially to see the impact on performance, right? while others may behave more linearly and so on. So what you can actually do is first learn a base expansion for your higher parameter space. Right? So instead of representing the CO the gamma parameter by single High parameter dimension, you could represent it by just basic, then the squared in the third degree, multiple dimensions like this, as we've seen in uh, any base expansion algorithm, um, and like polynomial linear regression. And if you then do that, then we can hopefully uh, fit, predict the performance of these high parameters using linear models. Right. So we can replace the complex Gaussian processes with Bayesian linear regression. Bayesian linear, Bayesian linear regression is just linear regression, which is Bayesian. And so it, it also gives you certainty estimates. Right. So this is very nice, it's super efficient, it's linear, uh, it scales linearly, but you first have to learn a good base expansion, of course. And the final technique that you can do, you can replace um, for a circuit model, you can also use boosting. Now, boosting, again, is not probabilistic. It performs typically quite well. It's also quite fast, uh, but it's not probabilistic. So you have to find a way to solve that. So what you can do is to actually not learn the mean, the black line, but you can learn like the 0 0.9 quantile, this top line here. Right. And then you don't have an uncertainty. But then you define a new acquisition function that looks at the 90th percentile and also looks at the distance of every point uh, to the nearest observed point. Right? 
And if you do that, you get an algorithm called Hyperboost, which does that. So it, it uses boosting, like GBM, um, to predict the 90th percentile, the 90th quantile, sorry. And uh, the, distance to the, nearest the distance to the nearest observation. Uh, and this gives you actually better fit than the Renner Forest, as you observed. Uh, it also handles conditionals very well and boosting different from random forest, also adapts well to drift. So the, if the data distribution changes over time while you're optimizing, or if you want to optimize over different um, um, days or whatever, uh, time windows, boosting will actually adapt to the changing data and it will keep your model optimized even if data changes. Downside, this is very new and experimental, so it has not been tested so much yet. Uh, this is the visualization of that. So again, we have this search space. We have this interesting point here. We actually have also interesting points here. Uh, here we have the mean, and yeah, the rest is the same. So different from what we saw with Renner Forest, we can see that this boosting method actually learns quite smooth surfaces. So they're not blocky at all. Um, and it quickly learns where the interesting regions are. It also spans, um, it explores the space more evenly, so it actually also explores this down part, uh, but it does stay away from the regions which are clearly not interesting. Right? So overall, this seems to work well. Another method, which is actually a bit older and simpler, um, is the tree of parts and estimators. So that, basically works by trying some hyperparameter settings. So again, we have this hyperparameter here. Uh, we have the loss here. So these are good parameters, they have low loss. These are bad settings, they have high loss. And then we, we fit uh, a KDE, kernel density estimate, over the red points and over the blue points. So this is a density uh, estimate over where the good regions, the good um, configurations are. And this is density estimation of where the bad regions are. Right? And then when you have to set a new point, you again uh, sample some points. And then your acquisition function is basically the predicted goodness of this configuration divided by the predicted badness of this configuration. Right? And the point where this ratio of good probability over bad probability is highest, that's the point you want to evaluate. And you can actually show this is equivalent to expected improvement. Um, this method is actually less sample efficient than Gaussian processes. So you need more iterations of this to find the solution, but it's very efficient. It's it's robust, it doesn't overfit so easily, and it's parallelizable. So you can you can parallelize this process um, over multiple machines, while based optimization you cannot because it's sequential. So you need to wait for the previous point to come in before you can choose the next one. Uh, while this method CPE actually can be easily parallelized. Okay. Another thing that you probably um, end up doing when you are uh, more experienced with machine learning is that you won't test every possible configuration on the entire data set. But what you can do, you can take a small sample of the data set and you can test many configurations on that small sample. And then only the ones that work well in the small sample, you will um, try on the larger sample. Right? This is the idea behind successive halving. So you take your entire data set, you halve it, you quarter it, and you halve it again, you halve it again, right? And you try a, a lot of combinations, a lot of configurations on the smallest sample. Then you throw away the worst half. So in this case, this bottom part, all these points downstairs, we forget about them. We then evaluate the remaining ones on a larger set. Again, we drop the worst half, we evaluate the rest on larger set, and then even the best ones, it's harsh to 
a bit hard to see now, but the best ones of these we select and we try them on the la on the last one. But, so this means we can actually find these good points without having to evaluate all these configurations on the entire data set. This is this massively saves you time. This is the same view uh, from learning curve view. Right? So we have all these configurations. Now every configuration is a curve, a learning curve. Here you have accuracy, validation accuracy. And you can see that we evaluate lots of them in the beginning. And then after some time, we say stop, we evaluate them, and then we kill the worst half of all the, the configurations. Then we let the rest continue to train until the next starting point, and then we kill half again, we train, kill half again, and at the end we have two left, and the blue one is the best one. Now, you can see the problem now. Um, we may actually be killing like the screen of this blue guy too early. Maybe this blue guy is on its way to be the best one, but we've killed it too early. Right? Some configurations are just slower, depending. If you change the higher parameters, you may actually have an algorithm that um, will work better, but will take longer to be there, will take longer to train. It's what we call a slow learner. So it needs more data points, but it will ultimately over, well, do better than any other method right? or configuration. So how can we solve this problem? Uh, one very simple approach uh, is called hyperband. So what you do here is basically you do this once, after you've done this once, um, you then, so this is the first iteration, you aggressively have cut half of them very quickly, and then we again cut, cut hard. Um, after we've done that, and we have our first candidates, we start a new bracket, we call it, uh, where we give all the pipelines more time. So we choose uh, all the configurations. So we choose fewer configurations, like half of them, or maybe log three of them. Uh, but we give them more time, so we let them play out for longer. But then we then kill them again. And the next time, we let them play for even longer. And last iterations, we do a few of them for the entire, um, we train them on the entire data set. So um, this is a good trade-off. So um, you reduce the chances of killing um, a conversion too early. And there are some proofs that tell you that doing this will give you near optimal results. And it also works well in practice. If you want to try it yourself, um, this is implemented in a package called KOS Tuner. So like I showed you before, you can build a model and you can just use hyperband instead of random forest, instead of random search. Uh, and this will uh, then use hyperband and at the end give you the best uh, model found. Right? So if you have to explore a large base of possible models and you can express them in this way, this is a pretty good technique to optimize the search, uh, well, optimize the model. You can also combine Bayesian optimization and hyperband. It's called BUHP or Bob. Um, so here we have a, simula a simulation where we uh, use TPE as our Bayesian optimizer. Uh, TPE in red here, and uh, random search in black here. So this space is regret versus time. So we want to have a model which gives us very good models with low regret in a very short time. So we want to be here somewhere. Now, random search um, chooses a model, maybe not the fastest one, trains them on the entire data set, and this is the first one. And the second time, it happens to find a better model, and so on and so on. Right, so random search um, does ultimately find better models over time, but it will, at some point, it will not uh, improve so much anymore. If we use Bayesian optimization, TPE, in the beginning, it will have the same information as random search, so it will not, it will behave very similarly. But after some iterations, it is learning something about the higher parameter space in the surrogate model, and so it will make more intelligent choices next. 
right? And you can see that now it actually finds better models than random search. If you replace random search with hyperband, you get about 20% speed up because you will spend less time evaluating bad models on the entire data set. Uh, even if you find a bad model in the beginning, uh, you can compute it very fast. And you can see also hyperband, the green line, um, does, uh, is, is a lot faster, right? So it, it does find better and better solutions as well. But after some time, it loses steam and it doesn't, will not improve so much anymore, right? Because it's, it's not learning anything about the hyperband space. And at some point, it will be surpassed by Bayesian optimization. If you combine the two, like Bayesian optimization and hyperband, uh, you can see it behaves like hyperband in the beginning. Uh, and then as it learns about hyperband space, it actually will do better. Right. So this gives you the best of both worlds. All right. If you want to use Bayesian optimization for neural access search, so to build neural nets, there's different tools you can try. Um, one of them is Auto PyTorch. So this is for, for, uh, for PyTorch. Uh, it's again, it's a plugin um, algorithm that you can just uh, call and just import Auto uh, PyTorch. Um, and it has one um, estimator basically for classification. Uh, you choose configuration, this is the smallest uh, config configuration space. Uh, you give it a maximum runtime and a maximum budget. And then it will explore the space of all possible neural architectures. You can choose whether you want to have uh, just dense neural networks or uh, convolutional neural nets. And in this space, it optimizes about 63 high parameters, things like learning rate, momentum, uh, filter size, and so on. And it will tune this all these high parameters using uh, base optimization and hyperband. Yeah, you can try that. You can just, uh, it's open source, you can just download it and try it. Um, there's another method um, specifically for residual nets. And there's another one for, uh, it's called progressive nets, which does a similar thing, but uses cell search space. So this is very good if you want to have this large uh, image data sets, such as Cypher or ImageNet. So this is the same ID, only it, it doesn't, um, explore all possible CDNs, but it uses the cell search space. So it's, it's especially useful for large image data sets. Okay, another idea to speed up um, the search even more is uh, network morphisms. So a morphism is a change to a network that changes the structure, but it does not change the predictions. So say that this is our initial net. So it has two large layers and two small layers. Um, one thing you can do, you can add this large layer here, which is an identity layer. So adding this just gives you the same outputs as it gets inputs, right? So the weights are such that it will also always just pass the input to the output, right? So adding this layer, in the net does not change predictions and will not change performance. Okay. So you can do this for this large layer. You can also add an identity layer uh, here in the small layers, or you cannot change anything at all. These are all morphisms. And then you can train them. And this training will now be much faster because you don't have to train this whole network from scratch again. You only want to maybe tune the weights of this extra layer. You give it, so basically what you're doing, you're giving this network extra capacity for learning. And if this capacity is needed, it will actually train these weights so that you get a better model. That's the idea. And so this, this morphisms allow you to search the space more efficiently. The main reason being that you don't have to train all the possible models from scratch as you would normally do, but you basically search, well, you actually only partially train every new 
uh, model that you built, which is much faster. Uh, so this is used in a tool called AutoKeras, uh, which again, you can download it. I think it's open source as well. Um, so you have to choose high level boulder blocks like, like image classification and so on. Um, but other than that, you can just let it run. Right, so if you want to build like an image classifier, you can just let this run for a while and it will return to you um, a, a trained, optimized um, convolution neural net, for instance, in this case. It also does dense layers and text as well. All right. Um, another idea you can use that's turned out to be very useful is evolution. So the idea here is that you evolve networks or you evolve pipelines over time. When we talk about pipelines, um, we start with simply simple pipelines in the beginning. Then we evaluate them, and then we choose two pipelines which work reasonably well. And then we evolve them. Evolving can mean we choose two good ones and we then cross them over. Like here we have uh, two pipelines, A and B. Uh, this has preprocessing option, like uh, operator like seven and then 11 and the model three. This one is 11 and two and then model eight, doesn't matter. And then we hope that if these are good, maybe this one is good because this has good preprocessing. And maybe this one is good because it has a good model. So maybe if we combine them together, maybe we get an even better pipeline. And yeah, let's cross over. And another thing we can do is mutation. So here we take an operator and we change it for another one. Or maybe we tune it. Or we or maybe maybe we reduce the pipeline by removing an option, removing an operator. So Basically, you just evolve the pipelines over time. There's different um, tools you can download, and they work, work a bit differently. So one is called Teapot. Uh, Teapot basically um, builds generations of about maybe 50 pipelines in parallel. And once all 50 are evaluated, it then uh, chooses the best ones, and the best ones will be crossed over, mutated, and into the new generation, and then you wait again until all these 50 are done, and then you start the next generation. So you have to wait between generations, which means you lose some time. Gamma is a tool that's developed here at TUE by Peter Geisworks. Uh, you also try it in the, uh, in the lab. Uh, Gamma is a synchronous, which means it doesn't wait for the entire generation to finish, but it will already start building new pipelines. It, it uses a more advanced uh, asynchronous evolution technique uh, for speeding up the search. It also does other things like uh, it also builds ensembles of the best pipelines. It has some other tricks as well. Um, yeah, so the nice thing about evolutionary algorithms is that they nicely adapt to the complexity of the problem. So if you have a simple problem, it will find you a simple pipeline. If you have a very complex problem, it will actually be able to learn a very complex pipeline. There's no limit on the length, for instance. Right? It also adapts really to evolving data. So if the data changes over time, uh, it will, you can keep evolving uh, the, the, the pipeline. It, it will just evolve to a new pipeline, which is better for the new change data which is very good for that. Here we have uh, another visualization. So in the beginning, we start with a simple pipeline. Every dot here is a pipeline. And after some time, we have evaluated a bunch of other pipelines. The color here is the goodness. So blue is not so good, and yellow is very good. And so you can see that from the pipelines we have, we take the best ones, and we let them procreate, and then from the best children, we had them procreate and so on. So we can see over time, um, the best models get offspring, which is even better. And then they evolve towards the best pipelines. Downside of evolution is it's, well, it's a pretty large search space. The space of all possible crossovers and mutations is quite large. So it can take a bit longer to run. There's other evolutionary techniques that you can try as well. Um, one that turned out to be very useful as well is particle swarm optimization. 
So here you must imagine that you are in hyperparameter space again. So we have, for instance, um, a pipeline which has a supervisor machine, so it has a C parameter, a GUM parameter. Maybe this is um, some kind of uh, feature selection technique, right? We also have a, has a high parameter. And we start with randomly choosing a number of high parameter settings. And this is a point in this space. And then we give this point a push randomly in some directions, which means that versus if this uh, high parameter is uh, the C parameter, if you push to the left, then this uh, configuration here will next time try a smaller learning rate or a smaller C parameter and so on, right? So you push them all different directions, which means they will end up in new configurations and then evaluate those. Now, every particle is not only influenced by the random push we give in the beginning called the inertia, it's also influenced by the best uh, configuration it has, has ever been in. So if this particle jumps around in this space, it will remember at which point in the space it had the best performance. And it will be pulled back towards that. And also, a particle is pulled towards the best solution found by this entire swarm. Because in this case, this particle was pushed to the left, but apparently that was not so good. So over time, it will be pulled to the right. And over time, they will all coalesce around the optimal solution. Another method uh, with a more complex name is called uh, CMES, or Covariance Matrix uh, Adaptation Evolution. Uh, this, is a, this only works for purely continuous spaces. It's also quite expensive, uh, but it's very competitive to optimize deep neural nets. So what you do, basically, is you randomly choose a point. You then randomly choose points around that point. You take maybe the 10 best points of these, and then you take the, the, the some point in between the middle, in, in between them. Right? And this will be your new uh, center. And then you sample around that again. And every iteration, you move towards uh, a new part of space, which is hopefully better. You can also use evolution to evolve neural networks. That's the same idea. You start with a simple neural net, and then you let it evolve. You add layers, you add skip connections, you add personalization, you add value, you add other things to it, right? So again, you start with a simple pipeline, you evolve it. Every dot here is a model. And you can see in the beginning it improves quickly. So here it has found this one. After more time, it finds this one. After more evolution, it finds this very complex one, which performs very nicely. It works quite well. It spends very little time with bad pipelines, uh, bad uh, architectures. And it's also quite aggressive in that it, it fairly quickly kills off old pipelines, uh, old architectures, focusing on the new ones. Uh, so this is work by Marielle et al. Um, a variation of this is Amubinet. Um, it's the same idea. So you use evolution, but instead of evolving the entire architecture, you only evolve cells. Right? So here we are again in this cell search space. This is our microarchitecture, and we want to um, learn a cell. We want to learn a normal cell, we want to learn a reduction cell. And instead of choosing it randomly or something else, using some other technique, we evolve them over time. Right? So in this case, we see this is our normal cell, which has, again, these separable convolution layers, 3 by 3, 5 by 5. Uh, and here we have reduction cell, which has lots of max pooling going on. So these uh, smaller. Um, well, sorry, larger filter sizes and so on to reduce the size of the of the <coughs> feature maps. All right, so this method is called AmoebaNet, and it's actually currently a thing still state of the art. Um, there are some more efficient versions of this, like uh, EfficientNet. Uh, this is currently state of the art, right? So the current best way of, of doing things right now for classification is to create a very specific search space 
that works well for uh, things like ImageNet, and then evolve the cells uh, so they're optimized maximally. All right. Um, this is a comparison of different techniques uh, for doing a NAS, neural, neural architecture search. So here we see in orange are evolutionary techniques, in blue, reinforcement learning trials, and in gray, random search. So luckily we were doing better than random search, but it's interesting that evolution actually does better than reinforcement learning. And it does a lot better. It finds better solutions faster. And you can take this to the extreme and you can wonder, well, it's sort of expensive that we have to, well, designing a new network, a new network is actually quite cheap, but the expensive part is training this to get the, the performance measure, right? <clears throat> so what if we just forget about that? Uh, we just fix the model weights and we only evolve the architecture. This is called weight agnostic neural networks, and it's an interesting paper. Um, it's a very interesting idea, and it seems to work well in certain cases. Right, so in this case, we have uh, two scenarios for reinforcement learning. Here we have this road walker, which gets input such as distance to the ground, angle of the knee, and so on. And it then evolves um, kind of randomly looking um, neural net that can gives you the optimal outputs. This same, uh, this case we have a race car that has to stay on the road. They've also tried this for ImageNet, um, and again, finds a solution. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a very, it's quite complex solution it finds, uh, but interesting. It's very interesting that you can just do that. It's super interesting. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing you can do is, of course, reinforcement learning. So we haven't covered reinforcement learning in so much depth in the course yet. But the idea is basically that we have an agent that's represented by a pulse network. So it's a, it's a fairly small neural, neural network um, that has to uh, make a prediction. Sorry, that has to, um, has a policy and the policy will return an action, you giving a state S. And the state in this case is the network that we're currently having. So we can initially the state can be just like an input layer or uh, just the input data set. Right? And then the, the next action that the agent can do is do things like adding a pipeline component to the pipeline or tuning a component or if it's a neural net, it can add a layer or change filter size and so on. And so the agent um, does an action. This action will change the state. And then maybe it does another action, change the state again. So it will keep doing actions, changing the state until the state is a complete pipeline or a complete neural net, and then we can evaluate it. The environment, basically in this case, will then evaluate uh, the, the the architecture or the, the or the model on a training set or on a validation set, and then the reward is basically the performance of this model on the validation set. And we use this reward then to update um, to go well, to compute the policy gradient based on the, the number of steps and the number of samples that we've seen, and use that policy gradient to update the weights of the neural net in the agent. And you do this over and over and over again for a lot of times. And that way the agent learns how to build a neural net for this particular task. Right. Um, because, you do, because you do multiple steps here, we call this a trajectory. Right. So if a certain policy will give you a certain trajectory, which ultimately will end up with um, a, a model with a certain performance. And you hope that over time, it learns better and better policies will, will lead you to better trajectories, which will lead you to better models. You can also uh, use reinforcement learning for NAS. As in this case, we have 
uh, technique. Uh, it uses um, an LSTM-based reinforcement learning. This is the proximal policy optimization algorithm. It uses a cell search space for ImageNet. And the way it works is that it uh, learns cells by taking first two random inputs and then using the enforcement learner to add something to those inputs. For instance, like a, a tree by tree pooling layer or tree by tree convolutional layer that adds them together and this will create a new state, a new layer basically that you add to uh, the set. And then you can choose to randomly you add uh, layers to that using your reinforced learning agent. Uh, yeah, that to the set. So, and that way you evolve uh, cells. And yeah, then you can try them. And this um, also got stable results on ImageNet. It's quite expensive though. Like reinforced learning tends to be quite expensive. Uh, this took 450 GPUs and three or four days of compute. And it evaluated over 20,000 architectures. And a final thing you can do is called hyperparameter gradient descent. So the idea there is that instead of optimizing the, the network weights and hyperparameters separately, you optimize them at the same time. So, um, so say, for instance, you have a certain um, New architecture. Say the architecture is fixed, but you want to, to tune, for instance, the learning rate, right? So, or some other high parameters. So, what you can do, you can first have an initial model, the, the, the initial configuration, the red one here. And after you do gradient descent, you end up in some point, right? And this is your, um, your current loss. So, we can represent this, this this curve here as a point in the hyper gradient. The hyper gradient is a space of uh, your high parameters, right? And this point is here. Um, then you can, based on that, you can see, okay, if uh, I, I can compute the gradient here in this space, I can now choose a new configuration, the green one. And then we try that one and we see our green is indeed a bit better. And we use that information to then choose a new point, the blue one, new configuration, the green, the blue one here, and this will get even better results. The variation of this is to learn a bi-level program. Uh, so here you can imagine the space of the weights and high parameters together. Right. Um, they don't interact with each other, but you can you can change the weight depending on a, well, given a certain high parameter, right? So the outer objective is to optimize the high parameter, of course, the learning rate. The inner object, the inner objective is given a certain high parameter like learning rate, find the optimal weight. Right? So say we have so you start here. Right? So we have a high value for this um, this high parameter, so learning rate, so a high learning rate. And in this space, we optimize the weights. And after optimization, we find this is the optimal set of weights uh, under this learning rate. And then we can choose a different learning rate like this one. And then again, we can optimize that. And then we can start looking at the what to do next, right? So what would be now the, given the validation loss we have, right? Uh, what is now the best new um, value for Lambda for this uh, learning weight, for instance? We can choose something here, for instance, and then we can, we can optimize the weights. So what we're doing is we're optimizing the weights and the high parameters at the same time. Right. And as, at some point, hopefully we find this point here. Uh, you can also do this in an interleaved way in which you alternate your stochastic gradient descent steps. So first you optimize your weight, then you optimize 
your um, high parameters again, then you optimize the weights for the high parameter, then you optimize high parameters again, then you optimize the weights for the high parameter, and so on, until uh, you find the best solution. And this ultimately leads to one of the currently most popular techniques for NAS, which is called DART, or Differentiable Neural Octet Search. So the idea here is that you start with a fixed one-shot model. So this is like a hypergraph, right? It's a space of all possible models, and you will evaluate all possible models in parallel. So you can express this as so these boxes are the tensors, and you have to choose which layers go between them. Right? These are just placeholders, toxic places in the network, right? Um, and you have to choose which uh, layers to put between those spots here. Right? So in the beginning, these are all possible combinations. This is just a very simple one. But this, this can, of course, be more complex. Uh, but we can express this as this. And so the space of all possible models is expressed by a number of weights. So every possible layer type that we put here has certain weight alpha. Yes, okay, so what we can now do, we can use bi-level optimization to, um, to, given this set of um, weights, we learn the optimal um, model weights. And then we can use that to then up, uh, update the alphas, right? So for the models, which, for instance, had a high weight and get bad performance, so we we'll get a smaller weight. For the, the layers which yield good performance, they will get a larger weight. Right? And over time, we evolve, or we just optimize, until we find um, a set of uh, weights, alpha, which will lead to uh, those layers at the end, that, that gives you the performance, and in the end, Hopefully, we have uh, a tuned um, neural network where all the layers are now chosen, and this will hopefully give us the best performance. All right. Um, so, so far, um, we have seen there's a lot of different very clever techniques we can use to optimize our pipelines or to optimize our neural nets. But we also saw that a lot of them are quite expensive, right? So given the task, they spent lots of time building lots of models, um, building a lot of energy into evaluating those right? until you find the best one, which is good. But what if you then have a new task, which is sort of similar, all these techniques that we discussed, they will basically start from scratch again. So they will forget everything they saw before, and they will start searching from scratch again, which we don't want. We want to transfer information from all these previous tasks to new tasks, because that's what humans also do, right? If we are, as humans, if you solve a task, in the beginning, you need a lot of time. For instance, if you learn how to walk, you have to spend a lot of time to learn how to walk. But next time you have a similar task, it will take you much less time. For instance, if you have to learn how to run or to how to learn a bike, you can transfer experience from this previous similar task to do the new task faster. And with a lot of experience, maybe you can solve new tasks right away without any more um, trial and error. And because the transfer learning, this is learning across tasks, makes us much more efficient. We can do tasks which we can solve new tasks with much less trial and error and with much less data than otherwise possible. <clears throat> so transferring information from previous tasks to a new task basically enters the new model to what we call elective bias. So elective bias is any information we give the model besides the training data. Right. Uh, some of this inductive bias is very explicit, like if you use decision trees, uh, just the shape of the decision trees is inductive bias. Right? It, it's the assumption that you can actually exp 
learn the problem as a decision tree. Right? Um, but this next device can have many shapes. And we can also uh, import prior beliefs about which models are good or which hyperparameters should be tuned. We can add constraints about maybe we want to tune some hyperparameters and not others. We can transfer representations, like embeddings from previous tasks to new tasks. And sometimes we can even uh, uh, transfer the model parameters that we learned to so the models themselves, the parameters we can also transfer them to the new task. So we call this meta learning or learning how to learn. And for, for doing that, we typically have a meta learner, which is given this metadata. Uh, so it looks at the metadata experience and the new task and uses that to then create a base learner. This base learner will then be used to build a model, uh, look at the performance, and then we learn from that to learn to build a new base learner and so on. Right? One example of this um, can be seen here in uh, for image classification. So you have different uh, image classification data sets like ImageNet, OmniGlot, Aircraft. And so the next time we see a new one like these bird uh, images, as a human, we won't need to start from scratch, right? We will have learned something from previous tasks that we can use to solve this task better. And likewise, we want to be able to uh, transfer information from these previous tasks to new tasks so that we can solve them faster. Um, in practice, there's different things we can do. Um, the simplest thing is search-based design. Right, so imagine that we have this very complex space of all possible architectures and high parameters. Like this is the view we have on the world if we are a beginning machine learning um, practitioner. So we see all these possible architectures. We don't really know what works, what doesn't work well. Uh, so we try a lot. Right, and after experience, we learn that given a certain task. Um, only some architectures make sense, or some high parameters actually need tuning, right? So we can use our experience to transform the super high complex space of options to a simpler space of options, uh, which you then only have to explore. <clears throat> and hopefully, um, this is also will give us a good enough approximation of this space. Um, Another thing you can do is once you have this space is you can, well, the naive thing to do is just to start randomly in this space or just randomly explore the space and, and then choose the best solution. Uh, but we can also use experience again. So if we have experience about similar tasks in the past, we can now choose not to start randomly, but to choose configurations which have worked well in the past on similar tasks and hopefully they will also work well on the new task. This we call warm starting. A final thing we can do is model transfer. It's the same ID as this, but this is on the, in the model parameter space. So if we know a previous model, which we've optimized, and we know that our new task is going to be similar, then we can transfer uh, this optimal solution, this optimal set of weights so we don't have to start randomly, but we can start with a set of weights that we hopefully work well better. Yeah, so very simple way to start designing a search space are model rankings or portfolios. So this is equivalent to having an expert that knows, well, I know algorithm A, B, C work well, so I'm just going to try those. Right. So, in more general terms, you can look at all your previous tasks, all your previous um, learning algorithms expressed as uh, high parameters in this case, and their performance. And you can use your experience, so all the models you build and their performance to build a global ranking of which models work well in general. Like, for instance, boosting also always works well, Runner Forest always works well, SVM works well, and so on, right? Um, or it can be very specific. It can be uh, uh, boosting algorithms with uh, maybe four-layer trees and 
more than a thousand iterations, right? Something like that. You can be very specific about this. Now you can, the, the most naive thing to do is now to just have this ranking and then just try all of these. We call this the top K method. You just try the top K methods and then take the best of those. Or we can use this as a warm start. We can, uh, for instance, instead of for patient optimization, instead of randomly starting with a random set of points, we can actually start the patient optimization with a set of configurations which worked well in the past on similar problems. Right? And then this actually will give you better uh, performance. Another thing you can do is to learn which hyperparameters are important to tune. And one approach you can do here is functional ANOVA. We've seen ANOVA before uh, to, choose, to, to select um, features in our data set. In this case, we use ANOVA to select high parameters that, that need to tune. So what we do is we look at the variance caused by changing each high parameter independently from others or combinations of them. And if we get a high variance, by changing the, the gamma parameter and SVMs, we deem this high parameter as important. While if there's very little uh, variance, we deem this high parameter as not important. And after we've learned this, we can decide, for instance, to forget about all the other high parameters and only tune C and gamma. Same here for rest nets, residual nets. Uh, here we learned that this is weight decay, momentum, loading rate are important to tune but maybe some other parameters are not supported to tune. Now, one problem with this is that you can have high parameters which have high variance, but which also have a very good default, and maybe we should just keep the default. It's not worth exploring um, that high parameter if it has a very good default value. So this, this brings us to the concept of tunability. So here we first learn a good default, right? So we, we try lots of experience, uh, lots of data sets, and from that we learn what is a good default for every parameter. And then we measure how much you can still improve over this default. And by doing that, you can again uh, learn whether which high parameters are important to tune. You can, for the ones that are important to tune, you can also um, look at which values are more important to tune. Um, for instance, here we have a forest. So in a forest, it turns out we want to have a small minimal leaf size, which makes sense because a small minimal leaf size will lead to very deep trees, which means lots of variance, which means when a forest will work better. Right? So in a forest, always use deep trees or use a, a, a small minimum number of samples. Boosting turns out uh, the optimal number of layers and other boosting is three or four, or apparently also higher than eight, nine seems to work sometimes. Whereas VM, it's a much more complicated picture. Um, usually makes sense to try small gamma values, um, but it's, yeah, depending on the problem, it can also behave quite differently. Okay. So after we've assigned the space, uh, we can do warm starting. We can choose interesting points to start the search with. Now, first question is, okay, this is useful whenever you have similar tasks. So how do I know whether I have a similar task? Right. So one thing you can do uh, is to compute meta features. So meta features are numeric values that describe a certain task. And if you have a bunch of these numeric values, you have a vector, and then you can use any distance like Euclidean or uh, maybe better, like a cosine distance, to compute the distance between tasks. So one way to compute these meta features um, is to hand graph them. So people have been put a lot of effort into defining lots of hand crafted meta features. These are things like counting the number of instances, number of features, number of classes, right? So here you say that two data sets are similar if they have this, the similar size, similar number of features, similar number of classes, similar numbers of missing values and outlines and so on. 
We can also look at physical features such as the skewness, kurtosis uh, within a feature, how much collision there is between features, how much collision there is between features and target values, covariance, parsed invariance, and so on. We can look at information theoretic properties such as the entropy in the class. Is, is it balanced or, in, or imbalanced? Is there mutual information between certain features in the task? Uh, what's the noise signal ratio? We can also um, build a simple model on the data set, like a tree, and then use properties of that tree, which is the depth, uh, as a description of the data set. For instance, if you have a very complex data set, you will end up with a very complex tree. If you have a simple data set, you end up with a simple tree. Right? So you can use the depth of the tree or the number of leaves as a description of that data set. And very common are landmarkers. So here we try some typically fast algorithms on the data set, and we use the performance of those data sets as like a fingerprint, as, as a property of data set. But if a data set is, gets very high performance for an A base, that probably tells us something about how their features correlate. Right? Um, yeah. So these are all handcrafted. So there are hundreds of these, and there are libraries where you can compute them with. Um, for some cases, these do not make so much sense. Like if you have image data sets, uh, this, will not, this will not give you too much information. Right? You can have identical sized images which have very different things in them. Right? So this, these, well, most of these won't help you so much. Maybe landmarkers will help you to some extent. In those cases, you can also use deep metric learning. So you can learn basically an embedding uh, for a set of tasks. This is for all kinds of image data set tasks. Right? You can learn an embedding, and then uh, you can, if you have two image data sets, you can use that embedding to, to compute the distance between them. Uh, the ground truth can either be based on some external measure. Uh, but you can also do it with brute force evaluation. So there are um, what we call taskonomies, which are graphs, well, graphs of tasks um, where the, the, the distances between the tasks are computed with brute force evaluation. So basically measuring how much similarity or transfer is possible between the data sets. The other thing you can do is build meta models. So you can learn direct mapping. So if you have a data set and you have the meta features, you can train a meta learner to predict based on the meta features, which is going to be your best model, right? Which is if you have a data set and it has, for instance, a very large number of features, it may recommend pipelines with lots of feature selection, or it may recommend algorithms which work very well with high dimensional data, for instance. Right? Um, we call this zero shot because they don't try. They just look at the meta features and just predict. Um, you can also have ranking models. So they don't give you the best um, configuration. They give you a ranked list of them, like a leaderboard. And then you have to go down the leaderboard trying these. You can also have uh, learners that, meta learners that print a portfolio, so giving a model it gives you a set of algorithms to try, or, or configurations. And you can even have very specific ones, which given the meta features and some higher parameters, uh, will predict the performance, or it's very hard, or it can also predict, it can also predict the runtime, right? So say you have, I know, uh, this data set with these properties and you have an SVM, it will predict that this SVM will take so many minutes to run the train. Okay. So these can be used by themselves, but they are also used within, inside uh, larger HTML systems. For instance, if you want to optimize runtime, you can actually have this meta learner that predicts the runtime to, for instance, um, give more preference for solutions, which can be computed fast. Um, 
Yeah, so very common approach uh, for using this warm starting is to warm start based optimization. So the idea here is that you have a memory of different tasks, you have the meta features, you have the configurations, you have the performances. If you then have a new task, um, instead of starting this based optimization from scratch, what you do is you compute the meta features, you see which all the assets are similar to your new data set. Then you see on the same data set which are good configurations. And then you start your you start with evaluating those hopefully good candidates first. And after you've done that, you give those to business optimization and to optimize them further. This is a very nice combination. So you get a big boost in speed in business optimization because you start with good estimates and your have less of a risk of using this best four algorithms, but even even if one, none of these four is good, your based on session will still find a good solution and will still be able to use the information it gets from those four points. So this is used inside Autoscale Learn, and Autoscale Learn is actually one of the winners of a lot of these RML challenges. <clears throat> So another very different idea is to use recommender systems to recommend uh, pipelines to you. So um, this is very similar to recommender systems like Netflix and so on. So in Netflix, users rate movies. In this case, uh, the tasks rate configurations. So if a configuration, like a model, uh, has good performance on a task, it has a higher rating. Um, so we can build uh, a matrix where we have all the tasks, all the equations, and then in the matrix we have values whenever we have evaluated the configuration on a task, and these are our scores. And then we can use matrix factorization to learn a latest representation for all the tasks and for all the configurations. And this create this creates a latent space. So we, do, we do this with uh, matrix factorization. So this gives us um, a latent space. And in this latent space, this is the latent space of all the configurations, every uh, possible pipeline here is a dot. And we can see that this latent representation nicely clusters uh, the different pipelines. So these ones are not so good. These ones are very good. And then in this latent space, we can now the visualization, which is nice because this is typically a lower dimensional space. So you can use visualization very efficiently. The main problem with these kind of collaborative filtering techniques is if you have a new data set, you have no evaluations. And you don't know which ones to try. It's called the cold star problem. Um, to get around that, you can still use meta features to predict which tasks are similar, and then uh, recommend you good points to start with. And that, that's one way to get around this cold star problem. Um, next to the meta features, because meta features are sometimes a bit tricky to use, and they don't always work so well. Um, so we can also learn which tasks are similar based on their performance on a new data set. So the idea here is that we have a history or a memory of all different tasks. Uh, we, we remember which algorithms we tried and remember how well they performed. Then we're giving a new task. And then we again try some configurations on this new data set and look at the performance. Now, if we notice that, um, at least relatively speaking, uh, we get the same performance or similar performance on the new task as we observed on another task J, then the task J must be somehow similar. Right? So if you have two tasks where the same configurations give you the same performance, then this must mean that those tasks are inherently similar to each other. Right? So we can use the similarity in performance as a similarity measure for how similar the tasks are. 
this is this we call active testing. So it's called active testing because we do this iteratively. We choose configuration, we look to performance, based performance, we find similar tasks, we use similar tasks to then choose new configurations, we test new configurations, look to performance, and so on. Right? And every time we try to uh, find a better uh, configuration, and we learn which tasks are more similar at the same time. Now, if a task J is similar to a new task, and we still remember the circuit model that we trained on them, then the circuit model will, will possibly also transfer well and will give us good predictions. Right. So the idea here is that per task T, TJ, we remember, we store the surrogate model that we've trained there. And if we have a new task, uh, we don't start the surrogate model from scratch, but we, we build a composite uh, surrogate model S, which is the weighted sum of all the previous surrogate models that we saw beforehand. Right. These weights can be uh, equal in the beginning, but after some uh, evaluations, we notice that some surrogate models will give us better predictions than others, and if so, we increase their weight. Idea being that if the circuit models are from similar tasks, then they will give good predictions of which tasks will work well. We can increase their weight and so on. So we learn these weights, and by learning these weights, we kind of uh, also learn a better surrogate model for a new task. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of techniques uh, for multitask visualization. Um, so this, this is, these are situations where you have multiple similar tasks and you consider them at once. Um, one application of this is, for instance, if you look at data sets over different days, right? so say you have some data from, from yesterday and the day before, and you've built optimal models for them, and now you have new data today, you don't want to start entirely from scratch, but you want to transfer what you uh, saw beforehand. <coughs> Uh, or there's some other way, but you have multiple similar tasks. So what you can do, you can actually have multi-task Gaussian processes, um, so which will give you better estimates by basically transferring information from these other tasks. Right? So if in, the, in if in these other tasks we see that this region of the search base is typically um, less or more interesting. We can transfer this information, which will change the prediction and will change the uncertainties. Okay. Another thing we can do, we can use Bayesian neural networks as surrogate models. Uh, so these are neural networks which are Bayesian. So they are they give you probability estimates, which are very nice. Um, they are quite expensive to train. They need variational inference and so on. And the final thing you can do is stacking. So this is what um, Google Vizier does. And this, this is explicitly for continual learning tasks. So this is like versus data from yesterday. And we see that yesterday we were overestimating points in this space and we were underestimating points in this space. And we solve this by uh, transferring a prior. Uh, so for the new day, uh, our prior will, will kind of uh, but these points lower and these points higher, right? Based on what we have seen before. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, this we saw before. So the idea here being that you want to learn a surrogate model, but you want to avoid having to learn uh, Gaussian processes. So you want to have these Bayesian linear models. But for that, you need to learn a good basis expansion. So what you can do is to take all your tried configurations and all your performances, and you can feed them into a neural net that then outputs these um, basis expansion and also the high parameters of your Bayesian linear regression model. Uh, this works very nicely. Um, so people have been training these kind of things for, which is using um, 9, 10 million runs from uh, uh, OpenML. Uh, train this neural net, 
and then make predictions about um, which um, base expansions should be used. Right? That's a nice paper about it you can read. And it's also used uh, inside Amazon SageMaker, I think. A final thing we can do is model transfer. So here we, sorry, <coughs> actually transfer uh, the model parameters themselves. One application of this is future learning. So in this case, future means we ha you have to make predictions based on very few examples. So this one gray box here is one task. So you're given uh, one example of a bird, of a tank, of a dog, or a person, and of a piano, and then you have to classify new images with only one example. There's different variations of this. This is uh, one shot five class, but there's different variations of this. Um, now, you want to train a meta learner that sees many of these tasks and has to learn how to create a base learner right, that can solve an individual task. One of these. Um, <coughs> one way to do this is to parameterize the base learner, and then the meta learner only has to learn the parameters of that base learner. And then the cost is basically the so if this represents your base learner, t is an element of your uh, your, your test set in this case. Uh, so in this case, you have a meta training set, which consists of multiple tasks, and we have a meta test set, which consists of multiple tasks. So after we train it, uh, we end up with a certain number of parameters, theta y, theta i. Uh, we compute the loss on the test set. So using these base learners, how well do they perform on this test examples, test problems? Um, and then we use this to learn a cost function, and then we use a cost function to update our uh, parameters so next time you have uh, a better base learner. There's two ways, uh, well, there's different ways that we can do this. I'll cover two of them. Uh, so, one is where we replace backprop with a new update rule specifically for a set of tasks. The second one is where we uh, don't start from a random initialized set of weights, but we start from a pre-trained or initialized set of weights that we've transferred from a previous problem. Okay, the first example is actually quite old ID. Um, ID being that, well, our brains probably don't do backprop, right? We don't compute gradients over weight spaces. So is there a simpler update rule that you can use to update the weights. Uh, so very early work looked at this kind of uh, biologically inspired uh, update rules, which are based on how neurons work. So they have they actually had learning rate, they had the reinforcing signal, they had pre synaptic activity and so on. Uh, it turned out not to work so well. A variation of this is to um, use a neural net as an audit rule. Right? So here we train a neural net that then learns how to update the weights for a specific set of tasks. Um, another work by Hawk here um, in 2001 replaced backprop with recurrent neural net didn't turn out to be so scalable. Uh, a few years ago, uh, people at DeepMind then replaced this with coordinate-wise LSTM. Uh, and this works uh, very nicely. So the basic idea is that we didn't cover, LS we didn't cover LSTMs uh, so much uh, in the course, but the basic idea is that you have two networks, a model, basic model, or Optima Z, and a meta model, the optimizer. And normally, um, this Optima Z, this model, has certain set of weights, and every iteration 
you would do backprop and then have a new set of weights, backprop new set of weights. Now you replace backprop with some update provided by the optimizer. The optimizer gets uh, the gradient of the output, the loss, which is put it into the model, also has the status passed, um, and then it gives you a gradient update. And then after the update, we get new weights, we get new outputs, we get new loss, we get this again into a meta model, gives us a new update, and so on. So we keep doing this for a number of times uh, until we hit uh, test set. Uh, then we back propagate through time, we update the weights of our meta model, and we start over again. Right. Uh, the nice thing here is that you can keep the optimizer and change the optimization. Um, so you can run this optimization over multiple tasks, or you can try different optimizations with the same optimizer. And you can actually train. This is like having two neural circuits, one neural circuit with this trained to learn task, and one neural circuit which is trained to optimize the other circuit. Um, that's, that's a very nice approach. Another thing you can do is to learn better initialization. Um, so we've sort of been doing this already with transfer learning. Um, so we've seen this before, right? So you can actually train a very complex neural net on a very large corpora, like Wikipedia, or a large image data set, like ImageNet. And we can use, like, like this is a convolutional net on ImageNet, for instance. And we can basically say that we can uh, reuse this convolutional part or some convolutional part and transfer it to new problem. So we don't have to learn all these weights from scratch, but we can use these weights, which are already learned on a much larger task. Right? This is similar to learning, in a, you, you transfer this learned representation of the data. Right? And we've seen that you can either use this for feature extraction, just adding the laser at the end. You can also just use these weights as an initialization and then uh, tune them end to end, or you can freeze part of them and unfreeze some of them and then fine tune them, depending on how much data you have. A very uh, interesting approach that's um, it's leading to a lot of research these days is small agnostic meta learning. So this, in this case, you learn an optimization for a set of similar tasks by optimizing all of them simultaneously. So say at some point we have a current instantization uh, theta, which can, which can be random, right? Uh, then we look at the first task here. The first task has an optimum here, which we don't see. Right now we end up in this part of the weight space. And if you look at the gradient, this will tell us that we should probably move in this direction. So don't look at the rest, just look at this point here. Uh, the, the greatest loss says we have to move here. And ultimately we want to end up there. Um, so we, we move, we want to move here, but we don't move that yet. We just, we want to move in this direction. Then you look at a second task, which is a bit different. Uh, so here the optimum is here and if you uh, are at this point here, now we don't want to move here, we want to move here. Right? And we also have a third task, and it tells us what, do you want to move over there. So since we want to solve these three tasks simultaneously, assuming that they are somehow similar, we can now say, okay, instead of moving in any of these three directions, we move in the sum of them. And that will give us this error here. We sum up the gradients, or we just combine the gradients, we average them out, and we end up in a new point here. So if we do actually we have here yeah, we sum them up. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, and we end up in a new uh, uh, set of weights here. And after a number of steps, right? Um, and hopefully we end up at some point in this weight space, which is close to the tree optimum. The idea being that our model will now not be 
completely tuned for any problem, but will be close enough so that with just a few training iterations, a few grain descent steps, we can find the optimum later. Um, there's an optimized theory around this, um, showing that there's no theoretical downsides to this method um, compared to some other method learning approaches. There's also a lot of, diff uh, a lot of different techniques that have been explored later. There's, uh, for instance, Reptile, which is the same ID, but um, uh, does more iteration. So it doesn't, um, yeah, so it does multiple of these steps before it actually up updates the weights. Then we have Platypus, which is a probabilistic version of mammal. We have also Bayesian mammals with online mammal. And there's lots of papers which discuss um, this method. What does it actually learn? Was it useful? Does it really work on our distribution? How different can the tasks be? And so on. Right? This is an interesting area of research. This is one example in uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, so here, the different tasks are different walkers, which look like this ant. So maybe this ant has four legs. Maybe another ant has five legs. Maybe one egg ant has um, one half leg and so on. So we train this end on different. Um, so every task here is a kind of end, in this case. We train a model to train any kind of end. And then after, well, if we then give it a new end, a new task, uh, we can see that it already starts moving a bit. It's not super well yet. But if we then only give one iteration of update, you can see it already does very well. So we have kind of pre-trained this and on a lot of similar problems so that if we encounter a new task, we can learn this new task much faster than otherwise possible. Right, and the final thing we can do is, of course, meta reinforcement learning, uh, because we know that humans often learn new games and tricks and, and games and so on much faster than uh, machines do. Um, so can we actually, so, and the, the reasoning here is that um, that's because reinforcement learning takes a long time to train. So what if we can actually do meta reinforcement learning? So we can train a meta reinforcement learner algorithm here that learns how to build RL agents or pulse networks in general. So we can give it different tasks, we put it in different environments, and this meta RL agent has to be able to uh, create new RL agents for any new environment, or typically it's a set of similar environments. Um, and yeah, that's the idea. So you spend a lot of time training this meta RL agent. This is a slow learning. But by training this RL agent over different similar environments, similar tasks, um, we can make it um, predict a, a new RL agent, which will then learn very fast in this new environment because it has, has information. It's not started randomly. It has information given by the meta RL agent. So it can optimize much faster. So one application for this in NAS um, is uh, to basically to build a reinforcement learning agent that creates the neural network. And instead of um, take training a reinforcement learning agent from scratch, we train on lots of different examples, different tasks. And it then has to learn across those tasks. So we can do that by, first of all, having a, uh, using a neural code. A neural code is just a code of numbers that is then translated into a neural net like this. And the RL agent can change this code to do things like adding layers or removing layers and so on. Right? Um, so we have an experiment here where we work across three data sets, uh, which are of increasing, increasing, increasing difficulty. 
This is called curriculum learning. So you want to start with simple tasks and then move to more complex tasks. Now, see in the beginning, on the first data set, uh, our meta RL agent is not doing so well. It's doing better than random, but it's not doing better than DQN. It's a deep Q learning algorithm. That, that's one of the best um, reinforced learning agents right now. So it's, it's, uh, we're outperformed by uh, the ZQN network. But if we then go towards the second uh, problem, um, so in the first problem, we well, we have some pulse entropy decrease, so we're learning something. Uh, the next problem, we learn a lot. Right, so now, having seen this data before gives us an, an edge, and we actually learn how to solve this new task uh, very efficiently. And if we look at the, the play out here, we see that uh, we're now doing slightly better than the, the reinforcement learning agent start from scratch. If you look at the third one, which is again harder, we see that now at the beginning we have difficulty because this is a very different problem than the flower problem. So in the beginning we are a bit lost, but at the end we learn how to solve it anyway. And we see here that over the entire range we've always done better than the, the reinforcement learning agent. So that's it. It's a very big field. Um, this is again an overview of the different tools we discussed. Uh, and you can use these uh, off the shelf, right? So you can use AutoSkillearn, which, um, which optimizes scikit-learn pipelines using base optimization, uh, also does warm starting and does ensembling of the best models. Uh, MLR MBO is very similar, but for R. Um, we have Hyperop Scikit-Learn, which you can use, which uses TPE. SKOpt, which uses uh, patient optimization using Gaussian processes. We have evolutionary algorithms like Tbot and Gamma. We use Gamma um, during the, the lab. We have H2O HTML, which does random search, but then stacks the best models. We have Herbaway, it's another method. Um, that does the right approximation and also does runtime prediction. Then we have uh, for NAS, we have AutoKeras. So this does uh, based optimization with net morphisms to build you optimized neural nets. And AutoPyTorch um, does the same for, for PyTorch, uh, but uses um, BOHP, so based optimization and hyperband. TensorFlow natively has random search and hyperband, and there's also a um, hyperparameter tuning, tuning library called Talos for Keras, which does different random search variables. So that's it. I hope you like it, and I hope you can use this.